How can we take our prayer up to the next level and bring it to the level of a dangerous prayer? That's what we're going to talk about today. Prayer is not a place to be good. It is a place to be honest. Prayer is not a place to perform. It is a place to be present. Prayer is not a place to be right. It is a place to be known. Prayer is not a place to prove your worth. It is a place to receive worth and offer yourself in truth. Kyle Strobel, When Prayer Becomes Real I have to admit, I've often looked at the prayers of people in the Bible and got too afraid to offer a prayer like that. So I read the book, Dangerous Prayer, Because Following Jesus Was Never Meant to Be Safe, by Craig Groeschel. The book's name appealed to me right away. Because I feel like sometimes I do pray safe prayers. I pray before bed. I pray for a good day in the morning. I pray over work. I pray when I have a problem. And sometimes I feel, "Hmm, maybe I'm not paying attention. I have ADD problems and I mentally walk away. I think of something else. Maybe I'm not doing this right. But as we know, God's grace makes it so that everything's right. He does the work and he brings this to me. And he makes the prayer right. But the question is, is how can we go that next step? When I heard Isaiah say, here I am, send me. Boy, that prayer always freaked me out. So then this book comes about and talks about how can we have dangerous prayers. He was even challenged by a friend. He said, hey, Craig, do you believe God still does miracles? And he said, of course. Good, because your prayers are so lame. How could prayer be lame? That's a really weird statement. But I understand that thought that sometimes our prayer seems small, asking for minor things because we're supposed to bring our concerns to God. And if those are concerns, we bring them. I'm not suggesting, and I don't know that he is either, that saying we shouldn't bring our concerns to God, we shouldn't come to God with the things that worry us, even if they are sometimes silly. I have some things going on in my house. I'm bringing that to the Lord in prayer. But the question is, is can we take it a step up? And he says too, he thought it was weird to do the these and the thous. I agree with him. I don't like the formal language. He also said though, sometimes felt uncomfortable with this um, very slangy, casual talk too. Is that how we talk to the creator of the universe? I think finding your way to talk to God is the way that you'll have to do it. I don't know that God cares as much as maybe we care how we talk to him, but I understand that thought too. As he studied the Bible, he started learning more and more about prayer and seeing how other people were praying to God. Now, he's a pastor, and so it kind of freaked him out a little bit that maybe even he too, as a pastor, as he stands up and prays in front of the entire church, isn't doing so boldly enough. And that when he looks at people in the Bible, they're crying to God. They're praying for help. Daniel prayed while he was being fed to the lions or put in the furnace. Desperate prayers. Jonah prayed in the belly of a hungry whale. I mean, who survives anything like that? So there are some deep pleading from God. People who are in desperate situations And we can imagine all sorts of situations where we see tragedy in this world and people praying, putting their heart out there because they really need the help of God. And so in the end, maybe that's why we feel like our prayers are less significant, maybe a little bit more shallow than other people, perhaps because we live a pretty good life. For the most part, we probably don't have very dangerous things to happen to us. And when they do happen, our prayers sharpen quite quickly. I notice that I still pray, even though I'm no longer afraid of flying like I used to be before every flight. And I pray that the travelers of the world are kept safe. And I mean it. And maybe the reason I feel that prayer so deeply when I'm on a plane, even though I'm not afraid anymore, is because I've lost all control. There's nothing I can do to keep the plane up. I can't fly it better. I can't do the safety checks better to make sure the plane is in good condition. I have lost complete control. And he says, too, he was praying that God would keep him safe 
and that his burgers and fries would be blessed. So he wanted to go in deeper. He wanted to find out how it is that we could do a better job or he could do a better job in praying. And so it doesn't sound like a car commercial. It doesn't sound trite, but some way of being more honest and open with Jesus. And he said that as he looked at the Bible and as he did this deep dive into it, he said he saw so many dangerous prayers, Luke twenty two forty two. yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Boy, do we pray that? Wouldn't we rather have our wills done? I'm pretty sure we would. But that Jesus knows exactly what we need, exactly what's good for us. And to put a prayer out there like that, Jesus did it first. We can follow in his footsteps. But can we pick up the cross and follow him through our prayers? And he says that when people came to Jesus, he didn't give them a soft answer. Again, think about the rich prince who was asking him, what do I need? And Jesus says, sell everything, give it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. That's Mark 10, 21. And then follow him. An honest answer to a prayer. We think that if someone came to us and asked us that question, maybe we have a kid and our kid comes to us and says, what must I do? We say, well, you should try to volunteer a little bit more, do a few more things. You know, we would couch it. We would make it easy. Again, I'm a small steps podcast. I would tell someone a small step, but Jesus doesn't do that for us. He told the rich, powerful young man the exact truth. He didn't couch it. He didn't put it down. And in fact, he probably knew ahead of time what the answer would be. Of course, we don't know what happened to him later, but I bet you those words sat with him for a long time. He says Jesus was a dangerous man of faith too. He touched leopards. He talked to prostitutes. He stood in the face of danger. Here's this guy from nowhere talking to the head priests, the powerful people of Jerusalem, Pontius Pilate. These were all powerful people at the time in his land. It is a difficult thing to do it. And you never quite think about that. But in some ways, it's about some person from the backwoods suddenly getting an opportunity to talk to the president and telling him what he thinks. It's a difficult place to be. But Jesus got there because of who he was, the truth that he told, and the fact that he never hid from the truth. He led with the truth. So we have a couple of dangerous prayers that are given as examples in this book. And if you want to read more about them, you certainly can. But the first one comes from Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is a deep prayer. We always know that David had those deep, heartfelt prayers. I know that when I go to church, and I see it a lot of times too, when you read the Psalms, they're not the most interesting things. Plus, they're in responsive reading, which kind of is complicated and hard. I grew up in the temple, and we used to read the Psalms all the time, every service. And sometimes they're just not that interesting. But when you start realizing what a heartfelt guy David was, This is why David was a guy after God's own heart. He is ripped out in his heart all the time. His emotion is right there. This is a guy, a powerful guy, or would be a powerful guy. And yet he feels everything very deeply. And he writes it down in song, in psalms, and is honest about everything he does. He asks how long he's going to have sorrow, how long he's going to be running, how long he's going to be in danger. How long is he going to feel his persecution of the sin he committed? We don't do that. Our prayers, he says in this book, is very comfortable. We tend to read or say very comfortable things. And in this book, he says, quote, your prayers matter. How you pray matters. What you pray matters. Your prayers move God. And that is an important thing. We look sometimes at prayer as a duty, as something to help us, which it is, of course. We want God to be with us, and we feel compelled to do it. 
you know, particularly inside the church, we say prayers for people, and of course we mean good things for them. But how many times is it a deep dive into our souls about how we pray or the things we say? And instead of checking it off in a box, I have a time blocking calendar, and every day I've dedicated time to prayer. And check, I've checked it off my list. Yet we see David through every situation he's been in, from the time he was being persecuted by Saul, he lost his son Absalom. I mean, there's all sorts of things that David went through, some his fault, some not his fault, but we see how David prays. And this is sometimes just shattering what he says. And so he says that when we look at this psalm, we're asking God to tell us what's in our heart. And we know what's in our heart. We know that Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, 9, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? And Jeremiah understood it, that if we ask God to show us what's in our heart, we're probably not going to like what we see. And so we want that honesty. We don't want to have God just confirm we're a great person. We want honesty. And sometimes we just couch our sin as being normal or preventing something from happening, but we don't realize that we have a disconnect from how God wants us to live. The other part of it is, too, is he wants God to reveal our thoughts, that we want this prayer so that God will bring us out, expose our soul, show us who we are, can search our heart. Know my anxious thoughts. So you're going to ask God, show me what it is I'm afraid of. We don't want to know what we're afraid of. We want to shove what we're afraid of away. See if there's any offense in me. Again, show me what I'm doing wrong and then lead me to the path everlasting. So now we want God to take us to the place where we're meant to be. That is a very dangerous prayer. You know how many times I've said that prayer or read it? And it just never struck me what an earth-shattering prayer it is. So we want God to help us take out that fear and help us go to the place that we're meant to go. The second prayer he talks about is in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, And when Jesus has given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I never really thought about it. And I think it's an interesting question. But the question is, what exactly is do this? Now, I think most of us believe and think that do this means have communion, break the bread, break the wine. And that's probably the proper answer. I mean, I think that's the answer I have. I read this over and over again. But the question is, when we break the bread, Jesus said the bread is his body. This is my body. And when we break it, we rip it apart, we separate it into little wafers. That's the crushing, the separation, the the ripping of Jesus' body. And the blood is poured out for our sins. This is not an easy thing. We are remembering Jesus being ripped apart and poured out for us. So we may not realize that when Jesus says, do this. What we're being asked to do is get away from the comfort zones, the things that we're clinging to, the things that keep us in our tidy packages. For us, bread is this very nifty thing. We go to the grocery store, it's perfectly sliced. But in this case, this was a loaf of bread that was ripped apart, just as Jesus' body. So we don't think of it in that sense. But he brings up this interesting point when he talks about the various people who were ripped apart in the Bible. The woman who poured perfume on Jesus' feet, we don't know what happened to her, but she became so overwhelmed, she probably took her tool of prostitution. When you're a prostitute, you had perfume. It was expensive. It helped you smell good. But it was also almost like a calling card, he said, that when you smelled a woman who had perfume on, You knew what she was seeking. And when she poured it out on Jesus' feet, beside the fact that it was expensive, it was also her prostitution calling card. And instead, she's like, here it is. I don't want it back. 
I want you to take this away from me. We see a lot of people in the Bible who were ripped up when they met Jesus. And because they went through all of this, because they were, he said, quote, broken and poured out, their lives changed. We think about the woman at the well. We think about the apostles who used to be different people. And suddenly they became different human beings when God ripped them apart and poured them out. Paul says, I die daily. Paul had a pretty comfortable life being what he used to be. Now he dies daily. So this is not about being, he says, comfortable, half committed. This is about taking a radical change in our lives. And the third prayer is, of course, the one that scares me the most. And then I heard the Lord asking, whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I said, I am here. Send me. Isaiah 6, 8. Whew, send me. And you're telling God, I am going to be here to serve him. Whatever it is he calls and asks me to do. That is a hard thing. God calls us to go, to love, to pray, to be somewhere else, to witness to other people. Send me. Moses said, hey, send someone else. Jonah says, I am here, Lord, but I am not going. There are all sorts of responses in the Bible you see to when God calls someone and tells them to go do something. Sarah laughed. The responses are ongoing. But this is where we have to take that prayer seriously. When we say, send me. He said that Isaiah saw the Lord. He saw the throne and the temples and the angels. And he described everything that he saw, the six wings and the heavenly beings. He tried to explain it. So this is someone who actually saw and met God. And so he knew that this is not a being to be casual with. But instead, God is a majestic creator of the universe who is given everything. He's majestic. He has glory. He is the father of salvation. He is the king of peace. He is the God of peace and the almighty one. We know that God is amazing. And then he lists a bunch of passages, you know, throughout mostly Psalms, where he is the savior, our stronghold, the one who blots our sins, the king of the universe. We've recognized all these different names we've had for God, but he is not trying to hide from us. He says, quote, he wants you to know him and delights in showing himself to you. God wants to be known. And when we say a bold prayer, send me, we are asking God to not only show himself to us, but to show our future to us, show how we're going to grow, show how we're going to go on. We don't have to bring anything to the table, brought everything. We just have to go. And I think this prayer scared me more than anything. I have spent a lifetime building a comfortable life with people I love and all the right things in the right places, a job I'm happy with, a house I'm happy with, and a daily existence that's very comfortable to me. I grew up in a situation where I had very few comforts. I had furniture that wasn't very comfortable to sit in. I didn't have the toys that other kids had. And I grew up in a pretty poor place, so people didn't have a lot. But I didn't even have those things. And now I've pieced together my world into this very nice package. Send me? I don't want to go anywhere. That's why this prayer scares me so much. But when we do this, when we ask God to show us what our future looks like, what kind of hope we can have, and what kind of things God could do through us, he says, quote, when you pray dangerously, your life simply cannot remain the same. So he says in the end, what are you waiting for? Close the book, open your heart, cry out to God, pray. It's a call to action. It's a call for us to go out and start saying the thing that we're probably very afraid to say to God. But it's about having that honest, 
close relationship. Because as soon as we have that relationship with God, he will show us the world. He will show us potential that we never could have known. And we will be walking in the way that God has asked us to be. So my challenge to you is say a dangerous prayer. What is the one thing that you know God calls us to do and ask for God to show you what he seeks from you? What is it he wants you to do? What is it he wants you to say? And ask God to give you the strength to do that. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that I'm always happy to pray for you. And if you have anything that you want to say to me about the podcast or thoughts about it or thoughts about your own dangerous prayer, please feel free to email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. And remember, our path on this planet becomes amazing when we start saying dangerous prayers. 